What is going on, Catella OG Original Geographers? It's Mr. M, and I am here to finish off one of the last videos you will ever have to listen to of Mr. Majewski this year. I am finishing up the Urban Geography Notes now. Before we start this video, we need to finish up the end of the last notes that you currently have. And then your substitute ought to have handed you out one more set of slides as well. So make sure that you have the slides that we will be moving to next uh, before really this video gets going. Now, in addition to that, secondly, uh, our students are at different places in different classes in the notes. Uh, so fourth period is finishing up the slide that is currently being projected. Fifth period hadn't quite even gotten to that slide yet, and I believe zero period is already done. Uh, but since two of the three classes have to see this slide, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start it here. I'm going to go back through this slide again. Then I'm going to move on to the new notes uh, because all three classes do need to watch that portion of the video. And then when I'm done with that, I'm going to come back and I'm going to finish up the last part of these notes for fifth period. When I get to that point, zero and fourth can turn it off because they've already gone through those slides with me. Uh, but obviously, fifth period has not, and I want them to be able to have the benefit at least of a video. So anyways, let's get this train rolling, and that means we are on this slide here, uh, the urban renewal and gentrification slide. So this is the list of vocab terms, if you remember, and I do know I made it through most of this list with a couple of the classes. I don't care. I'm going to start over again. Uh, because that's how Mr. M rolls. All right, so coming to you live, Mr. M in the house, as in like literally, I am recording this from my house. Let's get to it. Filtering. All right, filtering again, remember, is when uh, landlords purchase homes in neighborhoods in order to rent them out. Um, however, they don't live in those neighborhoods, uh, or they, and they oftentimes might not live even close to that place. They are detached, we like to say, from the home. Uh, another way of putting this or saying this would be uh, that they uh, they simply don't really... All right, it's Mr. M. I'm back. All righty, sorry about that, folks. I got hit up by a campaign video uh, phone call. Uh, anyways, filtering is when your landlord does not live in your neighborhood or even in the surrounding area. Uh, they oftentimes will buy property in order to rent it out, but uh, they're not really interested in the conditions of uh, that neighborhood or that community uh, because they don't necessarily live there. So filtering is actually a, a bad thing uh, most of the time. Uh, it oftentimes leads to um, neighborhoods that are already struggling, that are already distressed, becoming more run down um, and, uh, and kind of gradually um, getting into a worse situation as time goes by. All righty. Uh, so really a lack of regard for local services and upkeep, uh, oftentimes, again, it leads to abandoned homes and neighborhoods that are experiencing blight, which, of course, is another way of saying they are becoming run down and decayed. Uh, redlining, we already know what that is. Again, that, remember, is when banks would draw uh, lines on maps around particular areas, usually low-income or minority-heavy regions of a city. Uh, this usually prevented those people in those areas from getting loans or being able to move out and or fix up their place, which again leads and speeds up to urban decline, right, as many of these older neighborhoods deteriorate uh, without really any hope between filtering and redlining of being able to revitalize them. White flight uh, is something you better be familiar with. It's, again, the process that's really been occurring since World War II, uh, and it involves families in traditional white ethnic neighborhoods closer to city centers uh, relocating out to set, uh, suburbs and edge communities on the outskirts of cities. Uh, oftentimes these newer developments on the edge are, well, like I just said, newer. They're usually larger and more spacious. Uh, and since they're attracting a lot of middle and uh, potentially higher social classes to them, um, then that means they're able to generate more tax money. Um, than most other areas, which means schools, services, police, fire, those sorts of things, parks, uh, tend to be very high quality, uh, which tends to attract more and more middle and upper class families to them. Um, of course, the problem there is that wealth, that money that would have been able to be used to spend on services in the city is now gone. Uh, and so as a result, oftentimes it also speeds up the decline of many of those urban neighborhoods. Uh, again, it's led to more ethnic clustering in the United States as well, uh, because whites tend to cluster in these suburbs, 
Um, and uh, so we tend to see ethnic clustering happening more and more. Uh, this is not ordered by the government. This is not, um, you know, government ordered. All righty. This is just happening naturally as ethnicities tend to cluster together. Blockbusting, uh, remember, was when a real estate company would encourage white flight in a neighborhood, and they would do that by relocating minority families into that community. They believed it would speed up the process by which whites would leave, uh, and the real estate per companies could then benefit, um, one, by, moving, by receiving commissions on moving minority families in, and potentially by receiving commissions for moving white families out. Uh, again, leads to greater profits for them. It also contributes to uh, segregation in our communities, uh, and it oftentimes also contributed to further decline in many neighborhoods in the cities uh, who are losing those valuable tax revenues. Finally, urban renewal and gentrification. Uh, so the question is, what do you do to inner city neighborhoods that are struggling, that are deteriorating? Do you let them go? Uh, well, obviously the answer is most of the time, no. The government's going to try to step in. Now that could be the city, that could be the state, that could be the county. Uh, governments are going to usually step in and try to encourage redevelopment in areas. They're going to try to encourage uh, regrowth there, for lack of a better term, uh, to draw or attract, hopefully, people back into these residences again. Now, sometimes that means you got to completely redo the place, all right? got to make it more attractive, and there are different theories as to how that's achieved. Urban renewal was really popular, really up through the 1970s and 80s. Uh, this was the uh, traditional way by which cities were redone. Uh, and what urban renewal basically did is it went into a distressed neighborhood and it would usually tear the whole thing down. Uh, they would raise it, which means really just tear everything down and then just build everything back up brand new. All right. Now, uh, that's, there's, that's appealing uh, to some people. A lot of people like new buildings. It looks new. It looks clean. Um, the problem is, especially in these ethnic neighborhoods, uh, when you do these sorts of things, you tear down the buildings and you rebuild them back up as brand new buildings uh, in order to attract businesses and residents back. Uh, you know, you kind of lose that character. You lose the texture of that place, right? That neighborhood may have been around for 100 or 200 years in some of these cities. Uh, you just tear it all down. You lose every connection with the past, every connection with history, every connection with culture in that area. Uh, you might see old churches uh, get torn down. You might see historic sites, historic buildings. Um, it's almost like you're erasing your past. Uh, and a lot of folks have problems with that. That's one of the beauties of cities uh, is that they are these awesome, like, timekeepers uh, of history and of culture in a place. Uh, so destroying old ethnic neighborhoods isn't a great idea to a lot of people. They think it leads to placelessness. Uh, and so urban renewal has become unpopular today or less popular today. Instead, it's increasingly being replaced by something called gentrification. Gentrification is when wealthier social classes, again, return to a previously depressed inner city neighborhood in large numbers, and they spur massive redevelopment as businesses start to relocate there, too. Uh, usually this can be encouraged by governments, uh, city governments in particular. So they might start to rebuild a particular area. Now, that doesn't mean tear everything down. What that means is keep the outer exterior, keep the core or the skeleton of that, of that neighborhood. Uh, keep the buildings, but maybe go inside the buildings and completely renovate them on the insides. Then you kind of get a nice little mix. You have the mix of history and tradition and culture, uh, and you also still have um, uh, new sites and new features and new attractions, uh, modern attractions that are hopefully going to attract more and more people back near to that city again. Uh, so gentrification is really popular. It's the method to encourage uh, return back into the city again. Uh, and uh, it's something that nearly every city is doing. Anaheim is doing it with the packing house and other areas within our city, for instance. Uh, when Mr. Majewski goes to Cincinnati to grade your guys' AP exams, uh, one of the places that I go to uh, is a place called Over the Rhine in Cincinnati. It's completely gentrified. It was one of the most, like, ghetto places anywhere in that region of the country. A crime, murder, you know, all of these things. Uh, the sort of place most, uh, you know, most folks avoided, if at all possible. Uh, and uh, they completely redid it. Um, they've gentrified it. Now, it looks like an old school neighborhood still. Uh, but, for instance, they took some of the old huge Protestant churches that were made out of brick and all that stuff. Beautiful buildings on the outside. Uh, and they repurposed them. One of the places I like to go to is a place called Taft's Ale House. It's a three-story church that's been converted into a brewery. Uh, so, anyways... Uh, when you do that, you know, you start to attract young people again. Suddenly some of these people realize, hey, I'm kind of close to my work maybe. 
Uh, there's a lot going on here. Uh, maybe I should move into this area or move back. This is especially popular with younger um, Americans uh, and Americans without children uh, who maybe don't need that quintessential suburban home with the lawn and the yard and all of those things. All right. Uh, so anyways, gentrification popular. It is controversial. Uh, one of the negatives about gentrification is uh, that you oftentimes, the people who lived in that neighborhood before it was gentrified, uh, no longer can afford to live there after these changes start to take place. Property values start to shoot up, and suddenly all the folks who were living there that gave that place its character are all gone and are all forced to move to other locations or even, unfortunately, sometimes fall victims to homelessness. So anyways, these are key concepts that you must know, uh, and uh, it's important that, uh, that you understand them and are able to describe them. Uh, now, that's going to take us to the other set of slides, and we're going to go through these pretty quickly today. I want to start out with a couple of key concepts you need to know. Uh, beyond gentrification, there are a couple of new methods or strategies that American cities are using today to try to eliminate sprawl, to try to eliminate this growth out, outward from the city center, and to try to bring people back into the city core again. Uh, the first is called smart growth. Now, smart growth is a strategy specifically designed to eliminate uh, and better manage sprawl in American cities. How does this achieve? Well, a lot of cities and counties are now zoning the areas outside of the city where suburbs would normally be built. Uh, they're zoning them and saying residences aren't allowed there. Uh, so they're changing zoning laws. Uh, and saying you're not allowed to build homes in this area any longer, that's one way they can physically restrict the spread of suburbs. In addition, another smart growth strategy is to require green spaces. Um, those would be parks or green belts, uh, gardens and outdoor walkways uh, that are spread throughout your city. So every time you develop a new area, every time you allow a new development, whether it's homes or um, uh, offices, office space, uh, you also require there to be building of green spaces. Those could be that could mean you have to have a park uh, that you build for every development, or um, green belts like a walking path, or a bike path, or a uh, like the Santa a river trail. All of those things can be built to encourage more greenery, more trees, more vegetation to uh, avoid that concrete jungle look that a lot of cities have. Uh, Mixed-use planning is really popular today. Mixed-use planning is where you will have a building with multiple levels or multiple stories. Uh, the ground floor will have businesses, usually retail, um, that people can shop in. And then maybe the floors above are going to have apartments or condominiums or lofts. Uh, there's a great example of mixed-use planning right at the corner of Harbor in Lincoln near Anaheim High School. There are also a number of these that are located by Cal State Fullerton. Uh, this is a new style. The idea is if a person can live in a building and have shopping and retail underneath them uh, and everything stays within walking distance, that person's much less likely to live outside of the city. They're going to reduce the amount of travel they're doing. They're going to reduce the amount of, of car usage they're going to use. Um, the goal is to eliminate so much dependence on the automobile. Uh, in addition to that, smart growth involves uh, a focus on sustainable and green cities. We want cities that are energy efficient. We want cities that are able to manage water. Uh, we want cities that are able to better manage pollution. Uh, so these would be environmental rules, laws, and restrictions uh, that are established uh, so that you eliminate a lot of the traditional pollution and uh, urban destruction that you would oftentimes see uh, from, from us American consumers. Uh, suburbs eat up a lot of energy. They take up a lot of space. They use a lot of fossil fuels. They use a lot of energy. The use of cars to and from them does as well. Uh, so by making our cities more sustainable, by focusing on clean energy, um, we're better able to manage uh, these problems. And then finally, uh, you're going to want to redevelop your CBD. You're going to want to redevelop distressed neighborhoods. You might even gentrify areas. Um, of your city. All of this designed, again, to attract folks back towards the city center, reduce that dependence on, uh, on automobiles, eliminate the sprawl that is occurring. Specifically, one example of smart growth is something called new urbanism, and this has become especially popular in about the last, oh, 10 or 15 uh, years. Uh, new urbanism is the sort of designing of cities and urban areas that encourages walkability, 
Uh, it encourages uh, a lower reliance on automobiles uh, and fossil fuels. One of the ways that new urbanism is uh, is approached or created, and we watched the video urbanization on this, right? Urbanized, and it really showed this. Remember the guy that was on the bike traveling through his city? Crosswalks, uh, lots of them, lots of walking paths um, as well. You want to encourage walkability, so you need to make it easy for people to do so. Uh, you need to make these walkways, these walking paths, these crosswalks um, are accessible, uh, and they need to be plentiful. Bike lanes as well. Uh, you need to add bike lanes if you want to encourage people to use their bikes uh, as opposed to driving cars. These might seem common sense to you, but oftentimes in cities, these things were kind of afterthoughts. Um, they, they took a back seat, no pun intended, to automobiles. Uh, also, mixed-use planning is so important in new urbanism. If you want to encourage people to walk, right, if you want to encourage everything to be uh, within walking distance, you better have mixed-use planning, right, where you have people living in areas where retail and office and jo uh, office jobs are, are literally directly connected to where they live. Uh, you want to limit parking as well in new urbanism. Remember, uh, parking takes up a lot of space, um, and it just encourages people to drive more and more. You limit that parking space. You only allow certain amounts. Uh, you uh, have parking permits, uh, you uh, make people pay to park, uh, all of those things can reduce the amount that occurs. Uh, you need to have greater density. You try to encourage more density. Um, and what we say is you try to build up your city. Uh, so what we mean there uh, is if you have, um, you know, if you have a neighborhood where some of the houses have been abandoned, uh, maybe clear some of those houses and then build new houses there rather than just build brand new sub suburbs on the outer edges. Uh, it's called fill-in or building up. Uh, and those things are examples of new urbanism because they create greater density uh, and reduce our dependence on cars. Public transportation as well. You would better have good public transportation systems if you want to be uh, a new urban city. Uh, that would mean buses. Uh, that would mean subways potentially. Uh, that would mean any public transportation that's going to be used, going to be accessible, and going to uh, reduce people's dependence on automobiles. So again, smart growth is a general strategy. Uh, new urbanism is specifically a way that smart growth can be achieved. Please know both of those. Uh, populations of cities and LDCs, they've been, they've been surging. Uh, urbanization has been occurring. Migration uh, from rural areas is occurring. There are massive uh, NIRs in these, in these places. And so naturally, as a result, our fastest growth is happening in LDC cities today. Of course, this is a massive result of, of changes to the economy as these countries go into stage two or stage three of, uh, of economic development. Uh, then, uh, of course, we start to see um, movement to cities. The poor tend to live in the suburbs. They tend to live in the outer edges of cities. It's a lot like Europe. Uh, the rich actually live in the CBD, again, modeling European cities uh, and the exact opposite of American ones. Uh, these cities often struggle to provide jobs and housing, right? Uh, the services are usually especially overtaxed. I mean, if American cities can't provide services any longer effectively, can you imagine what the, si the situation is in a lot of LDC cities, right? Uh, squatter settlements uh, have popped up. Again, sometimes called slums. We prefer squatter settlements. A squatter is somebody who settles somewhere without legal permission. Uh, and, of course, uh, oftentimes crime is on the rise as well as pollution uh, in many of these LDC cities. Again, look at this map here um, of, uh, of, it looks like Brazil to me, yes. Um, and what you're seeing here is um, the, it looks like Rio. Uh, and uh, you're noticing that the wealthiest folks are actually lived in the CBD or in the center of the city. And then the further you get outward, the lower the income levels. Again, a great example of how... Uh, LDC cities uh, and European cities tend to be different than American ones. All right, speaking of LDC cities, here's what's interesting about them. Um, there are really kind of three types of cities, or I guess what we should say is um, a lot of these LDC cities, especially in Latin America and Africa, um, developed in a series of stages or waves. First, there was the pre-colonial stage. Uh, these were the European cities that popped up before Europeans. These are, I'm sorry, LDC cities that popped up before Europeans ever arrived. Um, very few of these exist in the world uh, today. Uh, those that did exist back then were often centered around religion and politics. 
Uh, they were completely unindustrialized when they popped up. So again, we're talking about places like um, uh, what will later be Mexico City, right? Aztecs and Incas, um, some of these massive uh, native tribes who built these massive cities. Uh, they did so without any sort of industrialization. Um, and so, uh, you know, the cities reflected that. They were popped out for religious or political reasons. Uh, then, of course, we have the colonial cities. Now, these were cities that popped up or developed when Europeans were colonizing an area. These generally copy European cities, since that's the folks who designed them and built them. Uh, they reflect the layout and the architecture of the colonizing country. So if the English colonized, they developed the English model, and you saw English architecture and buildings. Uh, if it was French, it was the French building styles, all right? Government buildings were usually laid out in a grid pattern uh, with a plaza or square, uh, in, in a plaza or square, and then various plazas and squares and fountains were created around that area, uh, which kind of developed like a grid-like pattern with squares in between. Uh, again, very common in European cities and therefore very common in cities that Europeans colonized as well. Then, of course, we have the post-colonial independent city. Uh, these are cities that developed or really grew after Europeans had decolonized, which means left these areas that had been under their control. These are cities that are rapidly growing today, and many of the time these cities are unprepared. The country that is now independent may not have the resources that the European country did, and so therefore you tend to see massive growth uh, at a rate faster than the city can provide housing or services to meet it. As a result, squatter settlements often form in the outskirts of these cities. Regardless of where you're at, these tendencies, these eras, uh, were pretty commonplace. So we have some LDC models that you need to know. There are three of them. Uh, they attempt to explain similarities, but especially differences with North American and European cities. Uh, we call it the Latin American city model, we call it the Af African city model, and then there is the Asian or Southeast Asian city model. Let's get to the Latin American Ford. Hey, this is the Latin, the foreign model that I have predicted would be most likely to pop up on an FRQ. I think there's very likely we're going to get one in the next few years. I can easily see it being compare Ford's model uh, to uh, an American equivalent uh, model. Uh, so uh, this is definitely something that you want to be familiar with, you want to be aware of, all right? Okay, so Latin American model is developed by a geographer last name Ford, um, and it tries to explain how Latin American cities have developed up until today uh, in comparison or in contrast to American cities. So, uh, first off, um, a Latin American city is going to have a central business district. Uh, but in addition to that central business district, and that's going to be a traditional one, all right? It's going to look a lot like you would see in Europe or the United States. Uh, but in addition to that central business district, and oftentimes attached to it, you're going to have a market as well. This is usually a, a, um, an open-air market. Um, it could be like a farmer's market or um, a bazaar or an area like that in the center of the city in which goods are being bought and sold informally. Uh, by folks who are generally making it at home uh, and then selling their wares to those who come to buy them. So you'll have your traditional CBD. At the same time, you will have this open market area in a lot of cities in Latin America as well. Um, and then it really starts to get interesting. Right around the CBD and this market area uh, is essentially a ring or a circle that's called the zone of maturity. That's where wealthy and middle class folks tend to cluster. So again, very different than American cities. They're going to cluster around the CBD and market as opposed to the outer edges like in the U.S., in addition to that, part of that zone of maturity, as it's called, and you do need to know this, this terminology, uh, is going to be gentrified areas, gentrified homes, whether are specially rebuilt and cater to wealthy individuals living in that city. Then uh, you will have what are called zones of accretion that surround uh, the zone of maturity. Uh, zones of accretion are usually lower class homes uh, that extend outward from the zone of maturity, really kind of all the way towards uh, the outer edges of the city itself. 
Then, on the outskirts of those, you're going to see what are called the peripherico. These are the peripheral zones. These are the squatter settlements. They're in orange on this map. Um, and they form an outer ring along the outer edge of the city. This would be where suburbs would be in the United States. Instead, you have these squatter settlements, these slums that are located in Latin American cities. Uh, now, what's interesting is the periferico, the slums, the squatter settlements, they have what are called zones of disamenity. Uh, they almost look like fangs, if you ask me. Uh, and they connect to the market zone in the center of the city. So there will always be these these slum corridors or these shantytown or these periferico squatter settlement corridors that allow folks living in the periphery to be able to still access the center market. Um, they will actually usually cut through the zone of maturity, the wealthier areas, oftentimes these wealthier areas therefore are gated communities or are somehow walled off or blocked out from the zones of disamenity. Then, that right there is like totally different than American cities. Then, you have this other really unique feature in Latin American cities. You have this cool spine, we call it. It's usually an industrial and a commercial spine. It's basically retail and industry. Uh, that are all clustered together. If they're not located in the CBD, they form like a spine, which is like a straight line that cuts across the city. Um, and it usually ends in an area that is like an edge city-like place that they'll call a commercial and retail mall area. That's on the outskirts of the city. Um, and uh, so the spine connects to the mall, which connects to the CBD in the center. All of that is where a lot of your business in retail, especially your high-end business in retail, is going to locate. And directly around that uh, spine is actually the wealthiest residences uh, because they want to be as close as possible to the retail, to the business, to the commercial as they can be. Uh, again, these are almost always gated and walled-off communities that are completely separated from the rest of the city. Uh, if you notice, the wealthiest folks that live along the spine do not have any direct contact whatsoever with the slums, with the squatter settlements, with the periphery, right? Uh, interestingly enough, uh, you just don't see that. Oftentimes, on the opposite side of the city from where the spine is located, the commercial spine as they call it, you're going to see industrial spine or industrial park uh, that has a lot of factories in it. Um, and a lot of uh, maybe lower skilled workers are going to be working in that side of the city, whereas the wealthier folks um, and maybe the more high skilled workers are going to be working uh, in the commercial spine, the blue, the black area surrounded by the blue. So a lot going on here, right, with this setup. You realize it's kind of hub and spoke. Uh, you got your CBD market, you got the wealthier communities around there, you got your richest, most elite communities that. Uh, surround the spine, the commercial spine. You're going to have your periphery on the outsides and then what are called zones of disamenity that connect to the periphery to the center of the city. Latin American model, know it. All right, that's the only thing I can tell you. African city model's a little bit different. All right, this is pretty interesting. Remember, African cities are the fastest growing in the world. Now, here right away is what makes African cities so different. They have what are called three different CBDs. They're going to have what's called the colonial CBD. This was usually the center of the country when the European colonizer was in, the in that place. Usually the buildings look European. The architecture does. Uh, and these were uh, usually government sites, government buildings, um, like uh, where the governor would have lived and where political decisions were made. Uh, so there's a traditional colonial uh, CBD. Then there's what's called your regular CBD that would look like it would in Europe or the U.S. That's going to have commerce. That's going to have banks and finance. Uh, it's going to look very similar to a U.S. CBD. Then you're going to have that market or that bazaar again. You're going to have a mass market area where all goods are bought or sold. All three of these CBDs are going to connect to one another, right? You're going to get the grid-like setup in the colonial one, right? Uh, you're going to get your uh, traditional CBD, right? Uh, it's yellow in this image. And then you're going to get the market, right? With all the open stalls, open spaces for products to be bought and sold. Um, ethnic and mixed neighborhoods then extend outward from the CBD. Uh, please note, 
that in African cities, they don't really cluster by wealth level, they cluster by ethnicity. So ethnicities and tribes will live amongst one another. Uh, and so there'll be ethnic neighborhoods that surround the CBD, different tribes living amongst one another. Uh, then you'll start to get into a mix of ethnic and mixed neighborhoods, which are about 50-50, right? Where you'll still have ethnic neighborhoods, but now some of them are going to be mixed ethnicity. And then finally, uh, uh, as you on the other side of that zone, uh, you're going to get mining and manufacturing. Remember, a lot of African countries are still using natural resources in order to develop. Uh, so mining and manufacturing tends to be located uh, towards the outer edge of the city. And then surrounding all of that, you get the slums. You get the informal satellite townships. Those are shanty towns. Those are squatter settlements. So just like Latin America, we see the squatter settlements in African cities as well because people are coming faster than the services can keep up. Uh, by the way, North African uh, cities don't have a particular model, but you should know they usually have a mosque that separates them from other African cities because they are Islamic. It's usually dominant. It usually uh, dominates the, the cityscape. Uh, so you can see it from far away. Uh, there'll be Muslim religious architecture in North African cities, religious buildings, smaller mosques will stand out. Uh, remember, there will be small or non-facing windows in many buildings in North African cities so that when a woman is in privacy and she's not fully covered uh, in, her, uh, in her clothing, uh, then she's out of the watchful eyes of men who might be uh, peeping, I guess, for lack of a better term. That keeps up with the principles of Islam. Uh, and uh, again, you're going to have market bazaars in Islamic cities as well. Uh, I hate to use this stereotype, but a little bit like the movie Aladdin. Uh, remember where there's that market uh, where goods can be bought and sold. All right, finally, the Asian city model, McGee, uh, is the geographer. Uh, so the Asian city model is a little bit different. It's not a circle. It's a fan-like shape, right? Um, uh, and... Uh, uh, what the uh, instead of a traditional CBD, because so many of these Asian cities are producing goods that are being shipped to the United States or other places, the traditional CBD in most Asian cities is actually a port. Uh, it's actually a zone that can be used uh, to export goods um, to foreign countries for trade. Uh, so that takes the role of the CBD in most Asian cities, especially newer ones. Uh, then. Connecting to the port, you're going to have commercial sectors. Those are sectors where businesses are allowed to locate. Uh, there's almost always what's called a Western commercial sector. That's going to be for American and European businesses to locate there. Uh, those businesses can locate there. They can use workers in that city and oftentimes pay them less than they would in their home country. And then uh, the rule is all of the products that are usually made in those uh, factories, in those businesses, then have to be shipped out of the port uh, back to other countries to be sold. The idea here is the Asian country is able to take advantage of um, the American businesses. The American businesses set up there. They employ workers from the home country. But the home country doesn't have to worry about their inferior products not being able to compete with the American or European ones. Uh, in addition to that, there will be a government commercial sector. That would mean sectors there where the government of that country might have industries it's controlling located there, like with China. Uh, or it just might mean areas where uh, businesses from that country are allowed to locate. Again, that's going to be connected to the port zone as well. And then finally... Uh, you're going to get a what's called a foreign uh, port, all right, as well. Uh, foreign port areas are usually for country for companies that are not located in the United States or Europe, uh, but are located uh, in other Asian countries so that uh, there's a spot for Asian businesses to locate as well. So again, you're not going to have the traditional CBD. You're going to have a port. It's going to result in a fan-shaped like city setup. Uh, and once again, you're going to have various commercial zones, a western zone, a government zone, uh, and oftentimes you will have a, um, a foreign company zone or an alien commercial zone as well um, for businesses that are not located in your country. Then, extending outward, what you're noticing is uh, the residences um, usually... Uh, kind of tend to follow uh, an American pattern. What we mean is 
Uh, you start to see middle-class residential zones uh, the further you get away from the commercial area. Then you start to see the newer suburbs around the outer edges of the city. Now, here's what's different. In Asian cities, new suburbs are often built uh, with squatter settlements in between them. So in the same zone that you'll have new suburbs, you might also end up having uh, squatter settlements as well mixed in. Uh, the highest uh, wealth levels in an Asian city usually cluster near the government zone, since a lot of those wealthy people in that country work in industries that are supported by the government or protected by it, they tend to cluster nearby those locations. Finally, really unique to the Asian city, uh, you're going to get that market gardening zone, right? Asian uh, populations tend to uh, value fresh fruits and vegetables on a, on a yearly basis. Uh, so there's a market gardening zone that allows folks to have, have those market gardens and be able to get their crops, fresh crops, to the market as quickly as possible to meet that constant demand that exists. Finally, uh, there may be a high-tech zone or some sort of industrial park that's technically outside of the traditional city area. It's a lot like a, a suburban mall um, or a suburban uh, edge city. Uh, it's got a lot of industry, high-tech areas, maybe even retail that clusters there. You see a lot of modern high-rises and buildings uh, located in that place. Uh, again, a lot of times Asian cities tend to want to copy or emulate American ones, so they do deal with sprawl a little bit more uh, than Europe and other LDC areas. All right, that's it. Mr. M signing off. Hope this helped. See you later. Time to get to your FRQ. Take care. Done, I should say, unless you were fifth period, right? Because Mr. M had to leave class early yesterday, uh, so I need to finish up these notes with you. Uh, so we're going to pick it up with peripheral model. Now, I know I left off here yesterday. I'm pretty sure you guys remember this. Hopefully, you remember it well. Remember, peripheral is really just um, uh, multiple nuclei. Only the difference is the various nuclei are connected around the outer edge of the city by a beltway or a ring road. All right, so... Uh, what this leads to oftentimes is a lot more sprawl because it almost encourages edge cities and suburbs to pop up even further from the city center. Uh, and these places oftentimes then might actually even develop suburbs of their own uh, as the CBD becomes less and less significant in the center city as time goes by. Um, I actually, by the way, galactic model and periphery are the same thing. So this is a sample of a, of a modern galactic city. Do you see how it kind of has this beltway, right? This freeway system that goes all the way around it. And you notice how a lot of the new developments cluster along the beltway, right? They almost follow the path of the beltway. It's almost encouraging or motivating edge cities to pop up. And remember, edge cities are cities that have a huge majority of office space office space and homes. Uh, and so it encourages generally wealthier folks to move out to that area uh, and to set up offices or businesses there so they can avoid having to travel to the CBD altogether. So again, you're seeing shopping centers and multiple nuclei develop here. You're seeing industrial suburbs over here, which are nuclei. You're seeing theme parks, which are uh, it's, an, it's its own nuclei. I mean, we, we have a great example of one with Disneyland here. Um, you're seeing a high-tech industrial area that's its own suburb and its own, uh, I should say, edge city or edge area as well. Uh, so again, you're just seeing the denuclearization of this city as it spreads out, uh, and oftentimes it's, uh, it's, it's scattered around the beltway or the ring road that encircles the city itself. Uh, so periphery and galactic model would be the same models. Uh, now, what's this urban realms? Urban realms is when those edge cities that we just talked about become so significant and so independent of the CBD, of the central city, uh, that they're almost independent completely and no longer connected to it in any way. Each realm or edge city develops its own suburbs. Uh, since these are suburbs that are developed around the edge city, they're edge suburbs, and we call them exurbs. So literally, it's like your suburbs are developing suburbs, and your edge cities are developing suburbs, and it gets to the point where each of the edge cities is so kind of large and, and significant itself uh, that it's no longer dependent or necessary for it to be connected to the central city any longer. Truly, each 
Edge City becomes its own realm, almost like its own world, um, no longer connected or dependent like it used to be. Um, so, again, multiple nuclei, you see the nuclei of the city spread out, the CBD becomes less important. Periphery, Galactic City, it's literally spreading out around that ring road that exists. And then Urban Realms is when the uh, edge cities that have formed have developed exurbs, uh, and it becomes so significant that they are truly completely disconnected from the central city even more. All right. Obviously, urban realms leads to massive sprawl. Uh, a great example of urban realms, they say, is San Francisco. Uh, in addition to that, Los Angeles is oftentimes viewed as one, or I should say Southern California, uh, because a lot of the edge cities around L.A. have gotten to be large enough and significant enough uh, where they really have formed their own cities and do not have to be uh, people there do not are not really dependent on the CBD of the central city at all. All right, so make sure you know uh, those models. Now, urban characteristics, what's going on in cities today uh, that a lot of American cities are dealing with? Well, one, uh, of course, we know they have high population and high densities. Uh, the gradient of cities, which measures how dense they are, uh, says that they're highest in the center, and then as you move to the suburbs, they become less dense, but even suburbs are still higher than rural areas. Uh, cities do have higher levels of crime. They have higher levels of unemployment. They have higher levels of poverty. Um, especially, I should say, inner city neighborhoods do compared to the rest of the city. This has a lot to do with a lot of people being in dense areas, uh, and so crime is common. You have a lot of new arrivals and immigrants in, city, er, in inner cities, and so poverty is a reality of life. Uh, you have lower levels of education in the inner city, and of course that's largely because a lot more people are poor, uh, and so they must work at earlier ages, unable to uh, really benefit as much from education. Uh, there are higher minority populations in inner cities. That shouldn't be a shock to you, right? This has a lot to do with uh, changing uh, demographics in this country um, and uh, a result of white flight. Uh, you're going to generally see older buildings, facilities, and services in the inner city neighborhoods. They're older. They were oftentimes the first neighborhoods that were built. Uh, and so your services and facilities are going to look that way. Uh, and sometimes they'll function that way. Uh, you generally see increased filtering and white flight out of these areas uh, compared to other places. Uh, you're going to have declining tax revenue and services, right? Obviously, if your tax revenue um, is decreasing because you're losing a lot of your uh, wealthier residents, uh, then your services are going to decline. And we've seen the expansion of ghettos uh, in many minority neighborhoods in, uh, in big cities, in inner cities. Uh, and this really process has begun in the 1950s and 60s, and it's continued all the way up till today. Uh, speaking of changes in cities, remember, uh, in developed countries, we notice uh, suburbanization, especially in the United States. Um, now, we have massive numbers of folks moving from city um, ethnic neighborhoods into suburbs. Uh, usually, again, this has a lot to do with automobiles and roads. Uh, they're chasing what's called the American dream, which means home ownership. Uh, and for many, many decades, the, the, the goal of many Americans was to own this home in the suburbs. I do think that's changing because of gentrification and other factors. Uh, please remember there's a much smaller stream occurring, but you need to be aware of it. It's called counter-urbanization, and it's happening in the United States. It's where folks who used to live in an urban or area or suburb uh, have relocated back to rural places again. They like the quiet. They like the peace. They like the serenity. They like the ideal of a rural, small town, or rural environment. Uh, also, the cost of land is much lower there. So if you are retiring, you're on a fixed income, uh, it's especially appealing to you. Additionally, there's a slow pace of life there. You get to benefit, you get to be close to nature uh, and the natural environment. And yet, because of technology, you can still be connected to the internet. You can still contact your friends via phone, right? And uh, you still have access to cable. And so you still have a lot of high-tech connections, even while you're still living out in that rural place. That's counter-urbanization. Don't confuse it with suburbanization. Both are happening. This is happening a lot more than this in the United States today. The very last slide are general rules. Well, hey, MDCs usually are the most urbanized. North America and Europe have the highest levels of urbanization anywhere. Um, in, but LDCs are actually urbanizing at a faster rate. So they're catching up. Um, and uh, that's happening pretty much across the board in all LDCs. Latin America is the most industrialized and urbanized of the LDC regions. Sub-Saharan Africa is the least industrialized and urbanized. Most Americans live in urban areas, about 70%, whether they live in the city, 30%, or in the suburbs, 40 
Uh, most Americans live in one of those two places. Now it's Mr. M signing off for fifth period. Have a great day. Review, please, for the...